lick yourself while I'm trying to film. It's not a very nice background sound. <laughs> Well hello there and welcome to my channel. My name is Liberty and it's that time of year again folks for the best books of the year. Now this year I rated 10 different books five stars so that is the pool of best books I'm picking from and they're pretty cracking folks. I mean they got five stars for a reason. We have quite a range. Um, the earliest was published in 1815, the latest in 2021. I read some of them here at home, some of them in Cambridge, some of them on the other side of the world. Um, if you want to see more about that, check out my various other videos. It's been a wild ride. This year has been amazing. And what's made it all the more amazing have been the books that I've been reading. So let's get into it. The first five star book was The Travelling Cat Chronicles by Hiro Arakawa. Now this is a book all about a cat. It's from the perspective of the cat which is just cracking. Now this cat is on a journey with its owner. They're going all around Japan, because it's set in Japan, translated by, ooh, translated by Philip Gabriel. So it's set in Japan, Japanese, and this cat and this man are traveling all around to all of his old friends. And for some reason, he seems to be trying to get the cat to live in one of these houses. No one seems right, but every person that they stop off at, you get this lovely little kind of backwards in time scene from their childhood or from when they knew each other as young adults or things like that. So you get this beautiful little portrait of friendship for one. And secondly, this absolutely adorable relationship between the cat and the owner. They are, they are truly family and it's adorable. And then obviously I saw it coming, but there's a big twist as to why this is happening. And it was, it was heartbreaking, the ending. I genuinely was weeping. Again, you can see that one of my videos at some point, I think, where I'm just sat weeping over this book. It was amazing. It was amazing. I really recommend if you want found family, friendship, pets, beautiful nature writing as well. There are some scenes where they're just describing the actual road trip itself through the Japanese countryside and it is gorgeous. And obviously that also ticked off Japan for my Around the World Challenge, which is great. Now the second book that I rated five stars this year was Conversations with Friends by Sally Rooney. Kind of basic of me, yes, I realise, but it was cracking. A lot of the time people either like normal people or Conversations with Friends, and I liked normal people, it was good. I think I probably preferred the TV show in a lot of ways, but I absolutely loved reading Conversations with Friends. I've got my trusty reading journal with me, by the way, with all my notes, because she's been fancy pants and written all her, all her thoughts out all year. So let's try and find conversations with... Oh, there we go. Okay, found it. Conversations with friends, five stars. And I read this in February. Okay. So the reason that I loved this, <laughs> I wrote discussion of chronic illness, in Francis's case, endo, hit me. It really did. It whacked me around the head. Francis, the main character, different from me in a lot of ways, but also there were some moments that just felt so deeply familiar, like her difficult family relationship, especially with her dad, her, her struggling with her body and not, there was this one line, I pretty, I can't remember what it is now, but there was this one line that was all, I don't think I underlined it, so well done past me, but there was this line that was something along the lines of, I, every part of me became a symptom, like my body became a symptom, something like that. And basically it's just about this, this sense, once you, once you are ill, once you accept an illness, everything that you have to monitor kind of takes on an extra quality of illness itself. Like everything, you're thinking, oh, my head hurts, is it because of the sickness? I feel really tired today, is it because of the sickness? Everything that you experience as a person, as a human being in a body becomes kind of tainted with this feeling of illness and I felt so seen and it was it was just it was amazing. Sally Rooney's writing is just kind of it's just gripping it's lyrical there's this weird distance and yet somehow so many of her lines also managed to completely stab you in the heart and it was just it was great. I haven't even told you what it's about really um okay it's about this main character Frances and her best friend slash ex Bobby um they live together in Dublin in Ireland and they become friends with this writer Melissa and Melissa's husband what's his name Sam no Nick who is an actor and basically these two these four people kind of 
end up having all these diff like really interesting almost incestuous kind of like relationships within the grid and it's really it's basically just all about like what is love what is what is a relationship how do you define these things how do you kind of express feeling it's about miscommunication it's about language it's it was great and it's about sapphics yeah <laughs> okie dokie the third book that i rated five stars i don't have with me because i borrowed it from the library at the time and that was fried green tomatoes at the whistle stop cafe by fanny flag i think is the author's name um and i read this all in one trip all in a 48 hour period while i was going to venice for my birthday i went for like two days and it was a whirlwind <laughs> whirlwind affair but it was it was a gorgeous time and reading this wonderful book at the same time and just possibly part of the experience is what made it be five stars for me but it felt so profound and so kind of complex and emotional and layered and I just loved it. Give me like a big cast of characters like a really kind of an interesting sort of human condition story all about people who relate to each other and I mean found family is also part of it and it's got a sapphic relationship right at the heart of it which is first of all shocking for something written in the 80s and second of all shocking for something written in the 80s about like the 1930s or something I don't know it's all it's all set from 1900 through to the 1980s so it's a historical novel already written a while ago and it's got like this sapphic main character and found family and it's just lovely. Also, apologies if I sound a bit breathless. Um, my entire family is ill and I think I'm getting it now. I'm starting to feel a bit sore-throated, which is great. It's not COVID, thank goodness, but not good. Okay, yes. So this was published in 1987, spanned 20s to 80s, changing time, so interesting, like the way they represent the change of time and the way that it wasn't a sort of linear story. So there was a lot of jumping, but somehow she managed to write it so that you could feel the, the, almost the taste in the air of different eras. And it was, it was really cool. There's a lot of really interesting race and civil rights kind of content because it's all about this like town outside of Birmingham, Alabama. Is it called Whistle Stop? No, that doesn't seem right. But it's this little town and obviously there are sort of the white power, the white powerful, quite related to the Ku Klux Klan, if I'm not wrong, minority. And then the actual majority of the town are black people, but they all live in this kind of out of town, almost shanty town settlement. So it's a very much a kind of a story of race and a story of how people relate to each other. But more importantly, it's these characters realising that there is sort of beauty and um, art and creation and wonder within black communities, especially when they go to Birmingham, Alabama. And there's this description of um, a black service, a church, a black church, which is, oh, it's gorgeous. It's all about sort of the euphoria of being among people that you belong with. It's, it's beautiful. I think it's the main character in the 80s, actually, because I, like I said, it's almost dual timeline. So the main character, Evelyn, or something like that. The only, the only kind of downside I felt was that Obviously, this is a historical fiction book, so to some extent it's going to have horrible things in because if you're being true to life, then you have to represent the Ku Klux Klan and racism and slurs and all these things to some extent. But then I wasn't totally convinced that this was being shown up in a properly negative light. Like there were kind of forgiveness narratives and sort of friendliness towards characters who exhibited these traits. And I wasn't totally sure how the author actually was trying to make you feel about these things. Obviously you don't want to go the other way too much and have a really moralising tone because that never reads well, it's not, it's not got the nuance that you need for a human story. But even so it didn't really kind of make clear what, what the purpose of this story was, if, if that makes sense. So that was a little bit interesting, slightly less good part of it. There we go. Also, it was interestingly multimedia because there were like news cli newspaper clippings within the story, which was very cool. That was a very incoherent thing, but yeah. Just a historical fiction all about this sort of out of the way little town in the deep south of America and the relationships of gender and race and class and just changing time and how changing time changes communities. I think that's how I would summarise the story and it was just, it was good. It was great. It also ticked off the 1980s in my decades challenge. That's great. Okay, number four, Watch Over Me by Nina LaCour, which was amazing. Oh my gosh. 
I had to order it from America. Like, I don't think Nina Lacour has like publishing rights in the UK or something. Don't know how that works, but basically the point is that no one publishes any of her books here, so you have to get the American ones. Um, but it was well worth it because it was amazing. So Watch Over Me is all about this main character. What's her name? Wow, I didn't even write down the main character's name. But the main character is a young girl who's just aged out of the foster care system in America and she goes to this camp, this almost like, it's almost like a camp, this big house run by this married couple, sort of very out of the way, very rural, and they, they're a very self-sufficient kind of homestead sort of household. And they take in a lot of foster children, not to the extent of it being like a group home, but it kind of is because they don't just take in sort of younger foster children, but also foster leavers, former foster youth who need that kind of grounding and safety and experience of a job and experience of support in order to get their feet under them, you know? It's found family to the max, again. I think you're, <laughs> you may be sensing a theme because found family just people loving each other even if they're not obligated to is just something I can never get over I find it so profound and beautiful and this story is even more profound and beautiful because that she's not just living at this place and kind of loving everyone and getting to know herself and these other people it's also a place where the trauma of these part of these foster children physically represents itself in the form of a ghost and it's incredible how they each have to kind of grapple with their ghosts and, and face them head on and sort of forgive themselves and this trauma in order to move on so it's a story of healing it's a story of it's a story of acceptance and it was just so gorgeous I I want to read it again now <laughs> again we've got a queer main character again you might be sensing a theme but more importantly you just have you just have love yeah. Oh, and that was published in 2020, so pretty recently. Number five, this is the very much oldest book that I rated five stars this year, which was Emma by Jane Austen, published 1815, like I say, the oldest one. And as you can see, my copy has got extremely battered because I had this literally everywhere. It was in transit between Cambridge and Bali and it got battered and bruised, but was so well worth it because it took me a long time to read in the sense that all big chunky classics do they take they take a little bit of time to chew over because the writing style is just more dense that's just how it is sometimes that goes very much too far and I just can't get my head around it and I don't really care and I don't want to grapple with it but sometimes it's really worth it it's that kind of it's like <laughs> it's like an elaborate pastry that you have to really carefully eat so it doesn't sort of like fall everywhere and get really messy but it's so worth it versus like a piece of toast which you can just chomp down and be done with right that's how I would <laughs> compare this kind of book to the average kind of contemporary novel because both enjoyable both definitely do good to you but there's a different there's a different meaning there's a different amount of effort you have to put in and therefore a different amount of reward I just loved it it's this story of this ridiculous arrogant little little so-and-so basically Emma who's a young woman with an ailing father who completely dotes on her so she's very spoiled she's absolutely insistent that she knows everything but more importantly that she knows everyone to the extent that she can match make and it go perfectly but it doesn't go perfectly she causes havoc she causes mischief and she's just so silly like reading from her perspective is so funny because she's completely oblivious to a lot of the actual goings on around her which you as the reader can tell and her growth as a person through the novel is like it's like it's watching someone grow up it's watching it's a coming of age story but not how you would expect because she's coming of age in the sense of accepting that she can be wrong rather than gaining confidence she's actually kind of gaining humility and it was just it was great it was great Jane Austen you're so funny again you have to kind of read the subtext in order to get the humor of Jane Austen it's not so much like Oscar Wilde which is like decisively witty like you read a line and you kind of chuckle because it's obviously supposed to be satirical and make fun of the characters it's obviously comedy but Jane Austen doesn't do that she kind of writes everything with this slight veneer of politeness and manners but actually underneath it's very very critical and witty and so funny I love Jane Austen I love Jane Austen ah. 
Okay, Emma was actually the sixth one because I appear to have... Well, that's confusing. Okay, so I think the next one is actually the one that came before Emma, but I'm... Yes, it is. So, I, okay, so I got it in the wrong order. But the next one, which is actually the fifth one, Emma is the sixth, was Last Night at the Telegraph Club by Melinda Lowe. Now, this was published last year in 2021, and... Oh, can you hear that? Why are there sirens? This is a quiet little, you know, finicky little English town. There are never sirens. What's going on? What's going on? So, Last Night at the Telegraph Club is... A book that I read for my Queer YA quest, if you want to see more about that, please check up here because it's been so fun so far this year. I've already made like eight, I think, but there's always more being read behind the scenes and I'm trying to catch up on myself with this because I just haven't really made any progress in the last few months. But earlier this year especially, I read a lot of queer YA books, putting them head to head in a tournament to find the best queer YA romance that exists. It's a pretty new subgenre, and it's something that's growing immensely, and it's something that's always developing for the better. I don't remember reading really any queer YA romances when I was sort of 12, 13. They really only came later. And so the amazing myriad variety that's out there now, I just, it makes me so happy and so joyous. And so experiencing from a sort of a nostalgic point of view, but also kind of investigating that which is available for the people that are younger than me, I love it. Now, last night, The Telegraph Club was very unique because it's a historical fiction about this ethnically Chinese girl called Lily who lives in, is it Los Angeles or San Francisco? One of those two. And she meets Catherine, um, who she's gone to school with this entire time for years, but just suddenly kind of they have a conversation and they realise that there's something there between them. They're both STEM girlies, but also they both just kind of want more of what's around them. And they kind of explore and they go to this queer club, this lesbian club called the Telegraph Club, and they kind of get to know the queer community and they meet this male impersonator, which uh, would nowadays be called a drag king. And it's, it's this beautiful, complex little microcosm of how queer people have and will exist always. You know, it's, it's about queer community and it's about people always needing spaces where they can truly be themselves. It's wonderful. But it's also about racism. It's about sort of anti-Asian anti hate because this is very much in the midst of the whole communist era where the communist scare, red scare era, I think that's what it's called in America, where like everyone was super afraid of communism and they were taking that out on Chinese, ethnically Chinese or just ethnically anyone who looked a bit Asian people in America because they were supposed to be infected with communism, you know. So there's so much complexity, but more importantly, there's just the classic heteronormativity, sexism, blah, 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 blah. The description though, the vivid historical detail is immaculate, immaculate to the extent there is a fucking bibliography to the actual fiction book. Like, Melinda Lowe did her homework, she researched till the cows came home, and it shows, because this is the most, the most detailed and vivid and descriptive and just completely wallowing historical fiction that I think I've ever read. Like, it was amazing. And it has a bibliography because it's that specific. It's, it might not be true in the sense that these specific people called these specific names, did these specific things, but it's true. And that's what's, that's what's so incisive about it, I guess, that it's true in everything it says, except names, you know? Ugh, Melinda Lowe, you knocked it out of the park. Then it was Emma, like I say. And then next one, we had quite a stream of five stars, can I just say, in this little era from May through July. I read a lot of five stars and amazing because it just added to my beautiful lovely experience in Bali and end of term summer shenanigans and just having these awesome books to read beautiful so the what was that one seventh five star book I read this year The Flowering Thorn by Marjorie Sharp now this is from the 1930s it was published in 1933 and it's just the most Silly little, I have a bit of a thing for 1930s books, I don't know why, 1930s uh, Britain specifically, because I guess I just love, I love classics, I love classics, and I love when there is just this kind of, it's nonsensical what the people in these books care about, what they are 
crying over these displays of show and politeness and manners and morality and value systems which are completely completely away from our own and there's something so beautiful about that the kind of you can let yourself sink into these kind of stories because they have no bearing on your life you know she's worrying about you know what party to go to I'm worrying about can I afford to eat like these are very different things and to some extent even though it's obviously abhorrent it kind of makes reading all the sweeter when it's when it's just something so completely a bubble of, of its own I, if that makes any sense at all so I'm reading this and I'm thinking you're so ridiculous but I'm enjoying it so much so the main character Leslie is this socialite from London who on a whim for no apparent reason decides she's going to adopt this random little four-year-old that her aunt has found who whose mother worked for the aunt or something but now this four-year-old Patrick is just there and Leslie's like oh well I'll take him she doesn't like children it's a stupid idea and every like actual intellectual moral bone in my body hates that hates it i really care about chosen family and i really care about the well-being of children and that was not a good decision on her part if this were real i would be horrified but because it's just a silly little story i'm like yeah you go off leslie you adopt four-year-old patrick and move to the country and have no idea what you're doing and again, found family dynamics, just this little village, which at first she hates and then she gets really into and she loves it. Growing familial relationship between Leslie and Patrick is just adorable. And it was just, it was so funny as well. Like I just, it was so funny. It was lighthearted and witty and brilliant. And I'm really sad that this is a lesser known book because I had to kind of search out this copy Marjorie Sharp was very famous at the time. She wrote like a lot of essentially contemporary books. Like, you know, she was the, I don't know, Casey McQuiston of her day. You know, she wrote a bunch of very well-known, very well-loved books, but she didn't get remembered for it. She hasn't really been remembered unless you happen to be specifically into like books from the 1930s by Forgotten Women. So I would say seek her out. Like it was so funny and it really, really made me laugh. It really made me happy to read this book. So give it a shot. Okay, I'm losing the light. I've no idea how much you can actually see of me right now. Number eight, Murder on the Orient Express by Agatha Christie. This is obviously another 1930s book. Agatha Christie, the queen of crime novels. She wrote in the early 1900s. Um, and apart from a very mysterious episode in her own life where she just like dis disappeared for a week and then showed up with no memory. Funky, by the way, look into it. Um, she wrote some really famous mystery novels which I think to the extent that she's the second most published author ever like her works are the second most circulated printed I guess I'm not sure what the specific net metric is but except for the bible Miss Agatha Christie really knocked it out of the park and Murder on the Orient Express is possibly her most famous one it's a name that is just floating around in the cultural consciousness and for good reason it was a banger this is a great cover, by the way. Well done to the Agatha Christie team who like republished all of her works recently with these simplified covers, which I love. Murder on the Orient Express is a Hercule Poirot detective novel. So she had several different detectives. A couple just did one book each, but Hercule Poirot and Miss Marple were two detectives that she did a bunch of stories with. Hercule Poirot, the uh, Belgian man with a massive moustache, <laughs> is just very sort of clever and down to earth and just, you know, casually watching and just like, hmm, hmm. Very, very good. It's, a, you know, similar energy to Sherlock Holmes, where you're just along for the ride. Like, you know it's all going to get explained in a dramatic reveal at the end. And I wasn't bothered trying to work out what was happening. I had my suspicions a couple of times during the novel. I was completely wrong. It was great. Just, it was great. It was Hercule Poirot investigating the murder on a train of this lad and then everyone was like oh my god that's so crazy what happened and he's investigating them all and he's just like what's going on why does everyone have an alibi what is going on and then there's this big twist and I should have seen it coming like I say if I'd actually put any thought into the situation maybe I would have but I just thought it was cracking and it's an extra impressive that I've literally seen the movie twice before and I forgot enough to still be completely bamboozled <laughs> by the twist in the book. So what a great story, what a great story. The kind that you can forget and enjoy all over again. Amazing. Second to last five star, we have Careless by Kirsty Capes. Now this is another story all about foster care, um, which 
you might be able to see is a bit of a thread through these books because I'm kind of I've been doing a lot of reading specifically into the foster and adoption kind of sphere of literature trying to understand more about it just generally exploring that as an angle because it's something I really care about and I want to know more and this one really 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 helped in that regard because it's specifically about foster care in the UK there's not many stories about that actually there's not much content about that be that because it's a relatively rare experience but that doesn't make sense there are literally thousands and thousands and thousands of children in the foster care system in the UK right now let alone the last like 50 years you know but this is a story of Bess I think yes Bess who is 16 or so 15 or 16 she's in foster care and she has had quite a dodge relationship with an older guy um, who she just calls Guy. The novel begins with her realising that she's pregnant and she doesn't know what to do. Eshel, her best friend, is fantastic. You have this best friend who's not just sort of a sidekick but has her own sort of difficulties and worries related to her, her parents being, I think, Bangladeshi. So she's ethnically Bangladeshi and they're very insistent that she get married and she's, she's struggling with how to come to terms with her different identities. Wonderful because that's like a proper subplot in the sense that she has her own worries that really influence the main character and the novel and are part of the resolution. Loved it. Eshel is a great character. Bess, however, is avoiding her issues. She doesn't want to deal with them. She's in a horrible, horrible foster home with a foster mum who just treats her like she is different, like she is not quite a child of theirs. She's not the same as their biological daughter. And the alienation that you feel as Bess is, is impeccable. Like it's written so well. Kirsty Capes really did this amazingly. And you feel the kind of the isolation that Bess feels and the way that she doesn't know who to turn to. And, there's, and so she just blanks it's 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 so amazing and the most impactful part of the novel where I actually felt sick I was kind of tearing up is when she's trying to get rid of this pregnancy she doesn't want to be pregnant she's only told Eshel and between them they try and get rid of it but there's this particular scene where Bess is so completely agonized and she finally faces these emotions head on and it drives her very nearly to suicide. It's it's so heartbreaking and amazing. If you want to understand, <laughs> if you want to understand the foster care system, understand people who are so easily villainized in the UK media, read this book. Especially, especially rele relevant in an era when reproductive rights and healthcare are being challenged, not just in the US, but in the UK as well. So it's something to really consider, really understand as a moment in time. Even if it's set a while ago, I think it's set in the noughties, but it feels so contemporary. Wow, helpful. <laughs> this is the last of my five star books um, and I've just completely neglected to fill in my thoughts. So well done me, um, thanks for me. It was published in 2018 and I gave it five stars and I read it in November, that's what I can tell you. This is The Overstory by Richard Powers. An absolute behemoth of a book, can I just say. It took me a while to read, but by God was it worth it. Almost like a classic, like I said about Emma, it took me a long time to read, but it was so rich and detailed and magnificent. And oh, it's basically just a love letter to the earth. It's this amazing meta-narrative talking all about trees. It's centred around trees, it's centred around the incredible variety of species and biodiversity and wildlife on this earth. And so the meta-narrative is where it begins with all these different chapters centred around different characters and you're like, how are these people related? They're just, it reads like a short story collection in a way, where each character has their own life and it's really detailed and a really sort of full chapter. And for some reason, all of their stories are centred around a tree. A tree influences their life in some ways. And that can be a tree that's etched into a bracelet in the case, case of one story, or a tree that was planted at their birth and lives in their back garden in another, you know? So trees kind of already influence these people's lives, but not in a way that they necessarily recognise to a, to, a, to a big extent. They, they interact with trees, they interact with the world around them, but unconsciously. And so then, over time, all of these people's stories start intertwining. Each chapter, you start to see characters popping up and the way that they interrelate with each other is fascinating. 
and it all kind of comes to a head where they have to consciously understand not just how they're related to other people in a sort of a massive network that is human society, but they're also intrinsically connected to the earth, to the trees, to the world around them. And it's it's just beautiful writing. It's just vivid and magnificent. There's this story where two of the characters live in a tree in a protest, I think... I don't know when it's set, it kind of gave me 70s or 80s vibes, like the majority of this novel. I'm not sure if it's actually really recent, but they're basically occupying a California redwood, I think, in order to sort of protest it and stop it from being cut down. The way that that section is written, oh my gosh, I sometimes feel like I've been there, like I've physically experienced being hundreds, hundreds of feet up in the air in this tree. They live there for 10 months. And the way that their entire sort of worldview, their entire being is redefined at this different scale, both physically and mentally, is just, oh, it gives me shivers. <laughs> it gives me shivers. It was so good. And I can't wait to read Richard Power's other book. I think he recently wrote another one called Bewilderment, something like that. But this one, by God, like it's, it's talked about a lot in sort of booktube circles where there's discussion of climate change or just nature in general. If you're interested at all in any of those stories, you have to read this. You have to read this because it was magnificent to the fullest extent of that word. Right, so that comes to the end of the 10 books that I rated five stars this year, but I'm gonna give a quick honorary mention to a book I'm currently reading. I'm not sure if I'm gonna give it five stars yet, but certainly 4.5, I would say. So it deserves an honorary mention, which is Oscar Wilde's plays, um, the importance of being earnest in other plays. So the ones that I've already read are, let me have a look, Lady Windermere's fan, Salome, a Woman of No Importance and The Importance of Being Earnest. I'm currently reading An Ideal Husband. And then the last one is A Florentine Tragedy. I love it. <laughs> I love it. He's so clever. He's so good at writing. Um, what an icon, really. And especially because I'm taking the time with it and really underlining things that kind of stick out to me. And I'm reading all the notes at the back and trying to properly delve into these things because reading plays doesn't come naturally to me. But I knew that I liked the importance of being earnest because I remembered finding it genuinely laugh out loud funny when we did a section in like year eight in school. So I knew I wanted to read The Importance of Being Earnest and it truly was very funny. But the other plays, once I really got stuck into them, have been surprising me with how interesting and sort of deep they are. There's so much complexity. Well done, Oscar Wilde. So give him a shot if you want. I would say The Importance of Being Earnest is the one if you want just like complete silly comedy. Like it's completely ridiculous and that's what makes it funny. But then there are other ones that are really, really profound and really speak to the social issues of the 1890s. For example, um, I really, really liked A Woman of No Importance, which I think is one of the kind of lesser loved plays in this collection. But it was so clever. There was a, there was a little twist at the end, which I just, it made me literally go, ha, when I read it. You know, vocalized shock. So honorary mention, Oscar Wilde's plays. So that brings us to the end of this video. Here we are, another year done folks, best books of 2022, and I've shown you my 10 favorites plus an extra. And it's been a fantastic reading year. I will tell you much more about sort of all the ins and outs of what I've been reading and what challenges I've been doing and the actual stats and figures, all that such like. Um, when I film my end of year reaction video, specifically reactions to Storygraph, because I've restrained myself from looking at my Storygraph stats the entire year. It's been hard, but I've done it. Possibly the most actual like delayed gratification I've ever experienced in my life. And I will be opening those stats up, seeing all the pretty pie charts and things, and verbalizing all of my <laughs> all of my thoughts and reactions to you. So if you want to see more details about what I've been reading this year, my myriad highs, my myriad lows, and more importantly, just the absolute wonder that are books. Join me for this next video. Make sure to like, make sure to comment, make sure to subscribe. If you want to tell me down below what your favourite books were, amazing, please do. If you want to recommend any books based on what I've talked about, anything fan family, nature, like funny, anything that's all just, just, just wholesome. 
I love a wholesome book. What can I say? I love a wholesome book with a bit of mystery. If you've got anything like that, <laughs> tell me down below because I'd love to get your recommendations and you'll catch me next year back in this same place and who knows what wonders I will have discovered by then. But thanks so much for being here and I really hope you have a wonderful rest of your day. Goodbye!